Hello everyone and welcome to video number six. This is our final video of Paleo Ecology in which we're going to be looking at global trends. So, to start this off I wanted to remind you and highlight that everything is interconnected. So the biosphere, that's everything that's alive on the earth, the lithosphere, that's all of its rocks, the atmosphere and even the hydrosphere, that's all of the oceans, all of those things are interconnected and interlinked. So for example, this diagram shows you how climate can go up and down between times in terms of temperature and that's often quite closely linked to sea level that could well be driven in many cases by volcanism you can see that um, there are broad patterns of change that exist uh, uh, along this um, this l very large 500 million year period of time and to understand those we have to combine geology paleoecology and chemical lines of evidence so we know, for example, through combining those forms of evidence that in the last 600 million years or so, the Earth has oscillated at least five times between ice house, uh, so that's cold and greenhouse conditions, and has most often been a greenhouse climate. And everything is related to all of these cycles. We can't unlink it all. So for example, we can look at big patterns and we can say that in general, ice house periods tend to have less diversity and extinctions tend to happen in, a, in, in many places at transitions between um, those ice house and those greenhouse states. And so everything is linked. And so we need to remember that when we're trying to understand patterns and processes in the evolution of life writ large. I've highlighted elsewhere that nowadays we can use the fossil record accompanied with digital tools to assess long-term patterns in, in the history of life and the history of Earth and study things that really matter to us, like biodiversity in uh, deep time. We've met this idea in my um, lectures on extinctions, but I wanted to give you a brief insight um, at the end of this series of lectures on paleoecology at the latest research looking at diversity in deep time and past climates. So this diagram here is another expression of that idea that everything is connected. And there are links, as shown on this slide, between sea level that's shown on the left-hand side here, this graph here. There are links between that, the amount of continental shelf that we see on the Earth, and that a proxy for that is the continental configuration that's shown here. Um, the more um, fragments of um, continent you have, the more continental shelf you have, and all of that those two things are in turn linked to the diversity of life as it would appear from this graph that's shown on the right hand side here. If you've watched my videos on paleo, uh, the history of paleontology, you'll know that this is a thing called a Sepkoski curve where we go from 540 million years ago through to today and we can tot up the diversity of life by counting, for example, the number of families as shown here on the y-axis as life has evolved, starting in the Cambrian explosion with animals and moving onwards from that point. Obviously, that is ignoring a vast swathe of past life before the Cambrian explosion, but here we are. So this is a modern example of one of these things called a Sepkoski curve. And Sepkoski collated his information from a wide range of sources on a wide range of marine animal families in general. And he graphed the diversity of these, showing these patterns. As we've noted elsewhere, dips in this mark extinctions um, in the history of life. But what I've not mentioned in my other um, videos about these Sepkoski curves is that he also suggested that there were three great evolutionary faunas, in the, at least in the marine animal fossil record. There was the Cambrian one, weird wonders that disappear sometime by the end of the Paleozoic. There was the more broad Paleozoic fauna, um, and then there were modern faunas. Okay, so these are um, groups that are united by diversity patterns and turnover rates and similar ecologies that vary with each other. And it appears on a surface reading of, of graphs like this that one has replaced another as dominant groups as the Phanerozoic has unfolded. It's a really interesting big scale pattern that people argue about all the time, but it shows the power of these kind of um, all encompassing analyses to show us something about the history of life on this really big and exciting scale. But note also that this suggests that there is an increasing diversity towards present. In general, this line goes up towards the right-hand side there. So let, let's think about that a tiny bit more. That's really interesting. We can ask ourselves, is that because the amount of diversity, uh, the diversity of life, I should say, genuinely increases 
through time, or could that just be an artefact? For example, we know we have more recent rocks, and we know that the current time slice of what is alive today is the very best samples of time slice that we have. So are we just better able to sample diversity in more recent time periods, and the older we get back, the fewer rocks we have, and the less complete our fossil record is? So that idea that maybe there's an artifact that look, makes diversity look high towards today is an idea that's called the pull of the recent. And if we really want to understand diversity, say, and biodiversity over deep time, we have to be able to overcome this. How can we do so? Well, I'm pleased to say that in recent years, we've started to move in that direction by using modern technology. And a really good example of this is the paleobiology database that's shown, um, the web interface of this is shown on this slide here. You, you can visit it and download the data yourself if you want to um, on these two links here. This is a curated list of 420,000 plus fossil species that record where fossils were found, what they are, when the species was alive, and much, much more about lots of these different species. And we can use resources like this, coupled with statistical techniques. These are often, but not always, applied using the programming language R to start to try and correct for artifacts like the pull of the recent and really dig down into what patterns are truly present and what patterns may be artifacts of our sampling. And the paper that I, uh, I borrowed this graph from that's shown on this slide here, the paper is referenced at the bottom here, is a really nice example of that. So this is a recent paper that takes this approach of using the paleobiology database to correct for um, fossil sampling. And it does this for 22,855 marine, so that sea-based animal genera. It considers both the sampling of the fossil record and also its geographical scope. So it cares about how well sampled um, fossils are throughout space as well as throughout time. And this figure shows what happens, uh, shows the diversity in terms of genus richness from the Cambrian through to today, if you correct for both spatial and temporal space and time sampling. In other words, I could say that these are spatially standardized diversity patterns. Uh, what, what each one of these different graphs show is just a different way of doing that correction. It doesn't really matter what the details are for our purposes. But what you can see is that if we correct for known biases, this paper makes the argument that there is little evidence for sustained long-term increases in diversity um, through to today. They rather make the case that a major control on diversity, for example, seems to be the extent of re reef ecosystems. And so it looks like, on the basis of this result, that looking after coral reefs is a really important things for, thing for us to do if we care about modern biodiversity, because that seems to be one of the primary drivers of biodiversity in the fossil record. But do bear in mind that this is one paper and actually there is an ongoing debate about the nature of biodiversity through to today in the literature. I wanted to finish with one more example of a really what I think is a really nice study of how um, understanding paleoecology in deep, deep time can help us understand challenges that we face today. And I do so by looking at a period of climatic change which, in the past, which can help us try and understand the impact we may be having on the Earth today. I could have equally put this in my videos on um, conservation paleobiology, and indeed I've mentioned it in some other videos as well. But this is one example of a really active and broad area of research that I thought I would touch on so you know it exists. And if you want to learn more about it, watch the paleoecology, um, sorry, conservation paleobiology, um, videos and uh, do some of the, the reading that I've, I've used to build these slides. So I've chosen um, a really nice example that's based on the Carboniferous period. During the Carboniferous, and there's a, a, there's a map of the Carboniferous Earth that's shown on the left-hand side of this slide here, Pangaea was forming, this supercontinent upon which the dinosaurs lived a few uh, millions of years later. So, for example, around 315 to 310 million years ago, where this map dates from, we had lots of equatorial land that was in this assembling supercontinent, which had a rich belt of a forest, what could be considered the first true rainforest ecosystems lying around the equator. 
all of these um, rainforests, we sometimes call them the coal swamps, were prone to being inundated when rivers changed their course or sea level changed, leading to those um, those forests being buried. And indeed, much of the coal that has fueled the Industrial Revolution today uh, in the UK, in, in Europe, and in North America actually comes from this time period and from this particular part of Pangaea. So we're looking at a very wet, moist climate, um, which has um, been really, really important for us as humans. But towards the end, uh, and I say for us as humans because we dug it up to burn the coal to fuel the Industrial Revolution. This is a long time before humans have their origins or anything like that. But towards the end of this period, and then into the Permian, those rainforests started to disappear from large parts of the globe. Each one of these black dots on this map from the Carboniferous represents coal, represents one of our wet ecosystems. Whereas by this um, Permian map that's from 250 million years ago, you can see that we have very few black dots, but rather we get lots and lots of these pink dots, which represent evaporites. These are rocks that are deposited when uh, an entire body of water uh, evaporates away, leaving evaporites at the bottom. And so these are deposits that represent a very arid ecosystem and or a very rap sorry, arid environment, I should say. So what we have between the Carboniferous and the Permian period is a, 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 a transition from a wet to a very arid globe. In the Permian, we see dryland vegetation and a more arid climate develop um, as represented by those rocks. So it's a really specific change between the Carboniferous and the Permian. And the paper that I wanted to talk about, led by Emma Dunn, uh, along with her colleagues, was published in 2018. And this looks uses a similar approach to the one I mentioned by Close et al. in the previous slides to look at what happened across that transition. So these authors have used paleobiology database data to correct for sampling issues. And they've done a, a network biogeography analysis of the fossils that they find. And what this has shown is that diversity did, in this situation, very closely follow the sampling that we have. The more rocks we had that could preserve fossils, the more diverse um, the ecosystems of the time appear to be. When we correct for that, as shown on the graph on the left hand side here, species richness appears to initially increase into the late Carboniferous, where we have these beautiful rainforest ecosystems, then decreases substantially across the Carboniferous Permian boundary when the fragmentation of these ecosystems and the aridification of Earth was happening, and it recovers very slowly into the early Permian. They also took the opportunity to cluster um, their fossils into those representing different areas, allowing the distribution of fossils to be assessed. Okay, and this is what they call their network biogeography analysis. And by doing this, based on this work, they suggested ra that rather than species becoming fractured and less widespread due to this event, a thing called the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, if you're interested, um, actually what happens is species become more widespread perhaps due to fewer barriers, communities become better connected, but at the expense of global diversity, which becomes lower. So you have fewer species, but they're more widespread as a result of this major change in the globe, uh, the globe's environment and the environment on Earth. And it's a really nice example of not just seeing the impact that climatic change has on ecosystems, but providing nuanced insights into how those ecosystems actually changed as a result of the climatic forces in terms of the species uh, ranges and diversity that we see at a very big scale. So I thought it was really worth mentioning and I can highly recommend reading the paper if you get the opportunity. And that brings me to the end of my paleoecology videos. I hope you found them interesting. I've certainly enjoyed writing these lectures and talking to you about them. It's a rapidly um, advancing and very exciting field. So no doubt um, there will be lots of exciting things to tell you about in the future. But in the meantime, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in one of my other videos.